And hello, everyone. I'm really excited about this evening. I was saying to Joel beforehand, this is a topic that's very dear to my heart and actually one I haven't been able to talk about, I think, until probably the last six months because some of this stuff is quite personal. So I'm really excited to share it with you today. But uh, just in case you um, haven't been to my site, and of course, I wouldn't have expected you to, um, I just want to make it clear that I write fiction and nonfiction. And I make my living from my writing and my website. Uh, I left my day job as an IT consultant in September 2011. So I've been doing this full time for a while, but as we'll, as you'll see, I did quite a lot of this while I still had a day job. So I just wanted to make it clear that I do both fiction and nonfiction, and I'm an indie author, um, entirely an indie author. So I self-publish professionally, and um, as you can see, they have, have made various uh, bestseller lists, and uh, so you can definitely do this with both sides. Okay, but um, that's me now. But I wanted to take you back to um, that picture there, 2008. That is me with my first non-fiction book. It was called How to Enjoy Your Job uh, or Find a New One, which is a terrible book title. <laughs> uh, I rewrote it as Career Change later on. But I wanted to show you that because I spent so many years, probably since I was a child, um, wanting to write stories, wanting to write fiction. And I kind of hero worshipped fiction authors. My mum was a um, literary uh, sort of a what well, she, she taught English literature so she was very literary focused I went to Oxford University so it was all very English literature so I had this kind of myth of what you should write as a fiction writer and uh, you know the only way I, I seemed to be able to get around that with my own writing was to write non-fiction and of course I love writing non-fiction and I still do it because it helps a lot of people and uh, it scratches a certain itch but I was desperate to write a novel so in uh, 2011 um, I actually put out my first novel and that's the cover designed by Joel, which is awesome because we met uh, back in the early days of blogging 2008. And I wrote, started writing that in NaNoWriMo and put that out in 2011. And now I've got um, 13 uh, novels and, uh, you know, things are quite different. <laughs> so, yeah, you can do these things over time. So as we go through today, I want you to remember that this is a journey. <laughs> and uh, as I explain things, you'll realize that a lot of this is mindset shift as well. So I'm really looking forward to helping those of you who do business writing, technical writing, because you can see there me in my pinstripe suit. Um, I used to work, you know, writing technical specs and, and that type of writing. So it was a massive shift for me to become a creative writer. So when I, I was thinking about doing this presentation and I put on Twitter, I asked nonfiction writers why they um, weren't actually writing fiction. And these were the most common things. And they're true. They were true for me as much as anyone. So I'm not creative enough to write fiction or I don't have any story ideas. And also, I always wanted to write fiction, but it's not practical. It won't pay the bills. And uh, nonfiction often integrates to a wider business. And many nonfiction writers assume that it's the only way to make money as a writer. So we'll be covering that this evening. So um, I'm going to go through a number of different things. Um, and the first one is to use your strengths as a non-fiction writer. Now, I've been, uh, some of you may have uh, read uh, Tim Ferriss's new book, Tools of Titans, which was out just before Christmas. Great book, and he has a great podcast. And one of the things I really learned from Tim this year was don't pay so much attention to your weaknesses, but double down on your strengths. And, you know, you can become a very good something, but you can't become a very good everything. Um, so this is something that I've really been trying to lean into. And this is what I think is really important for you guys as nonfiction writers. So these are some of the superpowers that I think a nonfiction writer has, which will help you write fiction. And we'll go through each in turn. So the organization and structure, because to write a nonfiction book, that's really important. Then uh, research. So, uh, you know, looking at certain Search terms, understanding things like SEO, which many fiction writers find really difficult, um, the language of the reader, uh, a work ethic. So, you know, there's this myth in writing fiction that you have to wait 
for the muse um, or that some some godlike power will come upon you and you will stream perfect sentences onto the page, which is not true. Um, and you guys know that because with um, I don't think that myth exists in nonfiction. With nonfiction, it's OK, I want to write a book on this. I'll sit down and structure it and then I'll write it. So that work ethic will serve you very well. And then finally, the belief in self-development, um, because you can learn and you can change. And many of you will write this type of self-development book, um, self-help. And if you write it for other people, then you have to believe it for yourself. <laughs> so that will be my challenge to, to you guys. So let's get into this in more detail. So the first thing is using that organization strength um, to think about story structure. Now, of course, we're only doing a short webinar today and I can't go into all the details of the story structure. But this is the, um, the sort of archetype of story. And this will work with your life. It will work with pretty much any best selling novel. Um, it will work with um, most best selling films. So all, like the Star Wars movies, for example, this is the classic um, hero's journey type of approach um, and when you actually think about it this way it you it means you can deconstruct what a novel is so again to write a novel you don't just go oh I'm going to write a novel sit down and start writing and see what comes out that will not make a great novel <laughs> what you need to do is think about story rather than writing and this is a massive mindset shift and you know some of these things will might go over your head right now but I hope I can just give you some things to hang information on in the future um, but when you start to think about the structure of story you realize that this is also a kind of thing that you'll do in a non-fiction book. You take uh, the reader on a journey and you lead them from one point of view to another point of view um, by the end of the book. So we can't go into all this in detail, but I wanted to show you the um, story structure that all novelists use, whether or not they do it um, consciously or not. But if you do it consciously, you can use this to actually structure your book. The second thing on organization is using a tool like Scrivener and uh, Scrivener for me absolutely changed my life um, back in what well, I wrote my first novel on Word and then I moved to Scrivener later on and it just it's just amazing. If you organize your writing with Scrivener and your research and everything, it's um, it's basically if you don't know, it's basically software that as you can see here, you create in little blocks and then you can drag and drop things into different orders. So like you write write non-fiction. It's, it's very unlikely that you write non-fiction in order. And I'm the same and I don't write my fiction in order either. <laughs> so Scrivener really helps me as an originally non-fiction author to kind of just put stuff down, plan stuff. You can see some of these are some of the plans for um, end of days, which is out um, end of January. Um, so I just wanted to show you sort of early stages when I'm just kind of throwing down ideas and research. So organizational tools like Scrivener and Evernote and other things that you might use for nonfiction are also superpowers with fiction. Then research. And again, this is something nonfiction authors are great at because often it will be like, OK, I'm going to write a, like I did earlier last year. I'm going to write a book on the successful author mindset. And to write that book, I will now go and read a ton of books on these other topics. So um, and then researching your readers is super important either. So understanding where your book is going to be in the ecosystem. I think, again, a lot of novelists are very overly romantic about their book ending up just being discovered somehow, whereas nonfiction authors are often a lot smarter about researching readers and writing a book more specifically for that niche. So you can see there that Nicholas Sparks book, See Me, that is a, um, a romance book. Clearly, George R. R. Martin has got a sword on, <laughs> you know, clearly it's, it's fantasy or historical. Stephen King, Black Cover, Shining, The Goldfinch, Literary Fiction, Pulitzer Prize on the front. Um, so you can write what you love, but you also have to write something that will find an audience. And I think nonfiction authors understand that pretty well. The next thing is your work ethic. <laughs> and I love this quote because it's from Stephen King, who is, of course, one of the best loved fiction authors um, in the world. And uh, he said, you know, you might say, well, Stephen King is the most talented writer around. But he says, you know, what separates a talented individual from the su successful one is a lot of hard work. Um, so 
I think nonfiction writers are very good at hard work <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'll all, often do a lot of it. So if you have that work ethic, uh, that will really help. So in terms of a practical way of applying that work ethic, there are specific ways to get that first draft done. So these are some of the, well, this is basically how I get a novel written. And it's pretty similar to how you would write a nonfiction book, except that you have to take the breaks off. And I think that's what many nonfiction authors struggle with, because if you write, say, like a book on the successful author mindset, I can say, OK, well, this is how I this is what I think about that topic. And that's often how you will start a nonfiction book is what do I think about this topic? Or if I research it, what does this other person think about this topic? Whereas with a novel, you are coming out of stuff from your head in a sentence about a character and in a place and all these different things. But the principle of getting the words down is exactly the same. So first of all, I would recommend that you schedule your writing time. So at the moment, you know, like Joel, I'm running a, a business. So I'm running the Creative Pen, which is a pretty big business now. But for me to write my novels, I'm I'm having to find that extra time because, um, you know, I have to get into a different mindset for the novel stuff. So I'm getting up at sort of 6, 6.30, which is, um, you know, earlier for me and not going to my email until around 10 o'clock and spending that time sort of immersing myself into um, the fiction side of things. So I'm scheduling that time. Now, where, where, wherever that time is for you, um, it doesn't matter. It just has to be at some point. So when I did... Um, you know, when I was working my day job, I would get up at, I think it was around 5 a.m., but that was easier in Brisbane, <laughs> in Australia, because it was sunny. Um, but basically, I would do my writing before work, because when I got home from work, I was just, you know, completely exhausted. So um, using those timed writing periods and just say to yourself, this is my novel writing time. And in that time, obviously, you'll be plotting and planning and thinking and doing other things than writing. But if you schedule it, you will actually get started on this project. And then also uh, don't start with chapter one because that will uh, leave you hanging for a long, long time. It doesn't need to be a perfect first sentence on a perfect book. And of course, you will probably know that from nonfiction because um, we always write the introduction last. <laughs> well, at least I do. Or at least you rewrite the introduction over and over again because it's, it's the most difficult thing. So um, yeah, don't start with chapter one. And the other thing is sitting with those feelings of discomfort and feeling like I don't have anything to write. Well, just start typing anyway. You know, um, Jenny walked into the room is, is, is a good example. Who is Jenny? What does she look like? Why did she walk into the room? What does the room look like? You know, what happens next? It's basically asking yourself questions, but just start writing and, uh, you know, something will come. <laughs> okay taking a drink there. So the next thing is, um, you know, we've talked about work ethic. The next thing is the psychology side and the self-development side and the belief that you are able to change. And this is a quote uh, from a writer, um, well, um, a writer who was taking my um, write and write a novel course, which we'll talk about later. But um, we're sort of saying, how do you feel? And how do you why are you not writing? And she said, the five minutes before I start writing, I feel like I'm about to jump out of an airplane at 10,000 feet. And I really like that idea, because that fear of jumping out the airplane is a fear of failure. It's equivalent to a fear of dying. <laughs> a bit like public speaking, I guess, in a way, it's something that will not kill us. You know, writing a novel or failing to write a novel or succeeding to in writing a novel or writing a chapter is not going to kill you. Uh, but it feels like that. So I want to acknowledge the fear of writing. And it's something I still feel like I'm planning this next series uh, around maps and cartography. And I'm really scared. I'm like, I don't, you know, this is a a huge topic. I'm at that point of wrangling it. Um, but I know there's also the exhilaration. So that jumping out the airplane, which I've done <laughs> for real, uh, is also exhilarating and something that you don't regret. So sometimes, you know, these risks we take um, are really important. And you guys know that as nonfiction writers. And I also like this quote from Austin Cleon, which says, don't wait until you know who you are to get started. It's in the act of making things and doing our work that we figure out who we are. And that means a lot to me because it was my fifth novel, Desecration, 
before I really lost my self-censorship. So I, I lost, well, I haven't lost it entirely, <laughs> but uh, basically I stopped being afraid of what people thought of me. Um, I will always be sensitive about what people think of me and my fiction because you're basically reading my mind when you read my stories. But I'm figuring out who I am through writing my books. And that book, Desecration, taught me so much about who I am. And I've, a I've been able to uh, just go so much deeper in, in my writing because of that book. So um, nonfiction writers often think that they need to be the expert in something before they start but this reminds us that you can get started without knowing everything and you can figure it out um, as you go and uh, and learn so much okay so to find ideas because one of the blocks is obviously I'm not creative enough I don't have any story ideas um, which is it's one of those things it's like a muscle uh, you you don't think you like I walked 100 kilometers um, last year in a weekend um, and I didn't think I could do that until I started walking a little bit walking half an hour a day and then an hour a day and then longer and longer and longer until I could do it it's the same with ideas now the big lesson I've had with this um, first of all is use Pinterest <laughs> Pinterest is amazing uh, that is a quite a technical tip but Pinterest I have all my boards for each book so and you can see there's some of the pictures that went into uh, end of days which is my most recent novel but the important thing is to follow and trust your curiosity. Now, I don't know what it is about technical writing in particular, but nonfiction in a more general sense, where you almost lose touch with what you are really interested in that is outside the sphere of your job or your main hobby, I guess. Um, but for me, it was really kind of discovering, oh, my goodness, I'm interested. This catches my eye. You know, if you if you pick up um, a magazine in a shop or you pick up a book or you uh, see a picture on Pinterest, which is why it's so great. Um, what are the things that you're drawn to? And I discovered that I was drawn to temples and archaeology and I like reading Dan Brown and I like religion and I like death culture and you know I write quite dark stuff <laughs> um, you know I'm drawn to these types of dramatic images I like storms the fir that first book Pentecost which is now St uh, Stone of Fire has a massive storm in the Arizona desert and you know so storms appear in most of my books and so when you trust what you're interested in, what you're curious about, that will lead you into ideas because then you can go, um, you know, that the temple of Hatshet soup there, which you can see in the top right, the, an Egyptian temple with a storm over it. That picture, there is there is actually a scene in the book uh, in End of Days, which is a storm coming over the top of the temple of Hatshet soup. And, the, you know, my people are in there. They are, And the question is, in my mind, what if there were people inside the temple? and what if these other people were coming to kill them what would happen then um, so these types of images and I'm an image person you might be a song person or a, you know whatever film um, start tuning into what catches your eye and what you notice and what fascinates you and other people will like this stuff too that's what's so interesting but what you have to do is start tuning in to your curiosity and once you tune it in you will be able to find ideas and the other thing is that fiction is mostly based on non-fiction research. That's me in um, a library in London, the London Library. And um, on my desk right now in front of me, if you could see it, I have, uh, what, 12 different hardback books on um, maps. So I'm this maps and cartography series that I'm thinking of. So I'm every morning at the moment, I'm just reading map books and writing notes and writing ideas, waiting for an idea to emerge from this kind of mass of reading. Game of Thrones is based on the War of the Roses. Um, you know, George R. R. Martin, a lot of fantasy is based on on history and you can get ideas from anywhere. And, uh, you know, of course, the great artist Steele uh, is, is one of the good quotes by Picasso and a number of other people have said it. But, you know, taking ideas from lots of places and turning them into something new along the lines of that archetypal story is basically how you uh, come up with a novel. But then the important thing is also to write down the sparks that appear. So when you um, get an idea, when you find a quote or a note or a thought or you visit a place or you take a picture, um, you know, 
note it down. So I have journals. I have a lot of journals. I write my notes at the moment in a moleskin journal. I use, I've just started using Evernote, which is amazing. I've been using Things app on my phone. I take pictures. I use Pinterest. Uh, then I use Scrivener. So I use a number of different things. Um, and then I kind of pull it all together. So however you do it, the most important thing is anything that pops into your head, write it down. So maybe from that, from the screen I was just on, I'll, do, oh, I'll just go back to it, this one, with the uh, pictures of, of Egypt there, you know, what stands out to you on that page? What is, is anything interesting? What stands out? If you do this with uh, other things, other books, other images, you will find ideas, but then write them down. Oh, one more thing on that. Um, trust emergence. I've got this written on my wall and it's one of my mantras. Um, I can't remember where I heard it, actually. I think it was Brene Brown on Jonathan Field's Good Life Project podcast. Um, but basically, if you put all this stuff into your head, <laughs> then it will come out. I absolutely trust that. And when you go to the blank page, once you have filled your head up with information and and ideas, it will come out um, according to that. Um, well, it won't come out according to that structure, but you can structure it as you go. But essentially, trusting emergence, something is within you that has urged you to even come on this webinar. <laughs> you want to write a story. So um, trust that something will come out. OK, so uh, once you found your ideas, um, the next thing is learning the extra skills you need over and above your um, nonfiction skills. Because, again, I think there's this myth that you're born a fiction writer, um, which I just don't think is true at all. Um, who is born knowing anything except, you know, we just we all have this innate ability to learn and then you learn and you practice. And that's exactly the same with any form of writing. I'm pretty sure that the first nonfiction book you wrote was not as good as the second or the third or the fourth. And I'm pretty sure that End of Days, my latest novel, um, is better <laughs> than the version of Pentecost that Joel helped me um, publish back in 2011. And uh, in fact, I did actually rewrite that in around 2014. So, you know, we learn writing. We learn character, dialogue, plot, setting, pacing, all these things and practice. So take classes, learn things and then practice. That's the same as anything else. And um, this is a, a metaphor that I was thinking about uh, when I was actually creating my course about how to write a novel, because when I thought, oh, my goodness, there is so much I want to tell people like there's loads. I've just been learning so much for years. But the point is, too much knowledge will stop you um, because you're kind of paralyzed uh, with knowing too much or researching too much. Or, you know, maybe many of you have hundreds of books on writing on your shelf or on your Kindle. I know I do. I mean, I still buy them all. Um, but if you tried to read them all and put them all into action, you would struggle. And there comes a point when, uh, you know, that analysis paralysis has to stop and you have to put this into practice. Now, you can write a novel with the little bit of information that you have above the surface in this metaphor. Um, and of course, there's always more to learn, which is why I think writing fiction is so exciting, because, um, you know, you can just keep on learning new things about story for the rest of your life. But you can definitely write that novel with the specific knowledge about the things you do need, like we said, character, setting, dialogue, that type of thing, plot. So take heart. <laughs> you can write with that top bit of the iceberg. And then I want you to kind of think about uh, when you're considering a book, you know, what, what are the books you love as a reader and what do you love about them? Uh, you know, how do the books begin and end? What is it about the character or the plot or the setting? Um, why do you want to turn the pages and why do you crave these books? And I use the example here of The Hunger Games. Um, and, and the other thing to do is to actually copy down passages from books um, copy I, and I did this when I wrote my first novel I wrote down the first line and the last line of every chapter in James Rollins map of bones I think it was because I wanted to understand how to write a thriller and I analyzed it and tried to work out why I loved it so much um, so that's a really good thing to do is think about the books you love and what attracts you to them the Hunger Games is a perfect example of that story um, arc that we uh, looked at earlier um, you know and it 
makes the struggle of one main protagonist, one main character, which is really useful. And I want, I do urge you to write about one main character <laughs> in your in your first attempt um, because it's much easier. And the main thing with character, and of course, all of these things are massive topics, so we're just uh, skimming the surface, but um, writing a character that people want to spend time with. So Katniss Everdeen from The Hunger Games is interesting. I mean, she's not a perfect character. She's quite unlikable in many ways. Um, she's standoffish and she can be um, pretty hardcore and she kills people, but we want to spend time with her. Um, Game of Thrones is not something that you want to start trying to write because it has so many primary characters, it becomes very hard to manage. So um, go easy on yourself, use that one main character, then think, what do they want? What does your character want? So Katniss, um, she, the story starts when her sister is picked for the reaping and Katniss wants to stop her sister getting killed in the Hunger Games, so she volunteers. And then what does she want? She wants to survive the Hunger Games. Um, who or what stops them getting what they want? You know, the other people, um, the bad guys, uh, some of her friends try and stop her in many ways. Her own character tries to stop her. Then how do they overcome the obstacles? So, of course, she has to get through these various battles, um, internal and external. And how are they changed as a result of the journey? Well, she becomes a kind of figurehead for the resistance. Now, I'm a thriller writer, so I've chosen a thriller example. But whatever genre you're interested in, and genre is a difficult word, but just think category on Amazon. That's how you can think of genre these days. Go to the books you love the most and find those core aspects of the story. And then plot. I mean, character and plot are the two main things. And again, you can have ideas like someone asked me the other day, what comes first, plot or character um, or setting or anything? Uh, for many people, it's entirely different. Um, so for me, it's often topic or place. So for my maps and cartography, um, I walk past a map shop every day in Bath and I started thinking, what if I inherited a map shop? You know, what are all those maps about anyway? And then I started thinking about stuff around that. So I started with a topic. Um, Stone of Fire was also a kind of um, a plot idea. And then my London Psychic series, I had the idea about a psychic who could read objects and worked in the British Museum. So it kind of was finding out the past of these objects. So consider what your character wants and why when you're thinking about your story. What is stopping them? Who is stopping them? How do they overcome things? And how are they changed? These are the prime questions. And if you can answer those in just a couple of sentences, just brainstorming, that will give you a really good outline for your book. Um, it really is as simple as starting that way and then doing the timed writing. But as they say, it's simple, but it's not easy. <laughs> um, OK, so then let's move into um, the final reason, uh, you know, that we said people don't write fiction is that it doesn't fit into a business model. It's impractical. You can't make any money. Um, and I'm sure many of you have heard some of the kind of Kindle millionaire stories. Now, obviously, most of those are the um, high end of the, the normal curve, um, so are very um, rare. But there is a business model for fiction that I am following and, uh, you know, that you might be interested in, too. But I've said here, do it for love as in do it to change your life, do it for the creativity in your soul, <laughs> or understand the business model and do it with more intention. Now, I started by doing it for love and basically doing it because I, I wanted to see what it felt like to write fiction and have ended up making it a core part of my business. So um, we all start somewhere. Now, this is the reason I love fiction so much. <laughs> and I'm sure many of you will get this. OK, the problem with nonfiction books and products is the constant updates. And you're like this hamster on a wheel. Like I really pity people who write books on Facebook marketing <laughs> or my friend Mark Dawson, who obviously has Facebook marketing for authors. Um, it, Facebook changed their interface every five minutes. So the moment you've written a book on Facebook marketing and published it, it's, it's out of date, you know. So this is the same with anything that's written about the technical arena. And a lot of nonfiction books might come into that category. My own book, How to Market a Book, it's on its um, second version, I think. And I need to put out a third version because things change. But fiction is amazing. 
it is truly scalable because you never have to update it. Now, of course, I did um, update that Stone of Fire book because i become a better writer. But generally, you should always be moving forward and not editing your old work. So um, a story is new to the reader who has just discovered it. And that, to me, is amazing. I mean, how many I mean, I recently last year went through a phase of James Herbert, who was an English uh, horror writer and uh, dead now. But I discovered him. Um, he wrote in the 70s and 80s. 80s and you know I never I was young then I was like seven years old so I didn't read it then but I discovered it last year and was like I read about 10 of his books <laughs> it was awesome because the story was new so with fiction uh, with non-fiction people are often looking for the newest thing but with fiction the backlist is so valuable and when I understood this when the penny dropped I knew that fiction could be a viable future for me like it actually is the retirement although I probably will still be writing books until I die um, you know, this is a model where you don't have to update, um, you know, the older books. They'll just keep making you money all the time. So uh, you can see here, this is how I followed my own model. <laughs> but this is the, the very first thing. If you want to actually incorporate fiction into your business, you have to write more books. Sorry, just taking a drink there. Uh, you have to write more books because one book will not make you a massive income. Now, again, this is um, some kind of myth, I think more in the fiction world, that your debut novel will come out, will make you a million dollars and you can retire. Uh, this is just not true. <laughs> um, even like The Girl on the Train, uh, la you know, over the last couple of years has been massive. It was billed as a debut. It was actually, um, the author had written books before under another name. It was a debut with a new name. So she'd failed, in inverted commas, under another name and they tried again. Um, but for indie authors particularly, writing more books and having a backlist is so valuable. I'll come back to box sets in a minute. Um, but basically, if you have these multiple streams of income, uh, that will make you more money over time. Also, if people find one of your books, they're more likely to buy all the others, which is cool. So writing a branded series, um, you know, in an era of binge reading and kind of immersing ourselves into stories, uh, this is important for fiction and nonfiction. Uh, so this tip will help you for both. Um, if you have a long running series, um, examples there, Janet Ivanovich with Tricky 22 and James Patterson writes lots of different series, Chicken Soup for the Soul, obviously. Um, once you have a series, people are like, oh, I want to know what's happening to that character. So they will get into that series and will buy more. And that happens far more more with fiction than non-fiction. Um, so many of my arcane readers, for example, have read all eight books and might have pre-ordered book nine, um, which doesn't often happen with non-fiction because people buy each book because they're interested in that particular topic. The other thing is uh, once you've got a few books in the series, you can use a funnel just the same way you use for nonfiction. So Stone of Fire is perma free on all ebook stores. So people can download that and um, they will, uh, you know, that's the first book in the series. That is the most recent cover and version of what was Pentecost back in uh, 2011. So that's quite cool. Then the other Looks thing. Better. Oh, sorry, Joel. It looks a lot better now, Joanna. <laughs> Your cover was amazing. It was that time in my life, but things changed. That, that, was, the, that was the thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so going um, going short. Now, I know that a lot of non-fiction authors write short books, and this is one of the standout indie authors, uh, Steve Scott, or SJ Scott, who writes habit books and makes a massive amount of money from writing a ton of small books on habits. Well, you can also do this for... Um, fiction. These are novellas um, by H.M. Ward, who's one of the best-selling romance authors, erotic, you can probably tell, <laughs> active romance. Um, these are less than 40,000 words, often only sort of 25 to 30,000 words. I've got um, three novellas, four novellas, something like that, um, and they're all shorter. Uh, they sell for two ninety nine. so you still make some, you know, you still make two dollars per per copy and you can write them a lot quicker. So if you're worried about writing a sort of 110,000 word um, epic, then why not just try writing a 30,000 word novella? Um, I actually find novellas easier than short stories. So it's not really the, the length. <laughs> short stories are really hard. Novellas are easier. Um, novels are really hard. So there you go. Um, to, it's about how much you can keep in your brain, basically. But yeah, going short is a, is a good tip. 
And then um, going long, uh, this again is a tip for fiction or non-fiction. I make, I'm, I need to calculate it, but I, I had a look at iBooks and Kobo. 50% of my income at iBooks and Kobo is from box sets. Now, if you're not doing box sets and you've got more than three books on a particular topic, whether it's fiction or non-fiction, then you should be doing a box set um, because it's just amazing. They, uh, they seem to have their own ecosystem, actually, um, and they're really easy to make. You just get a cover. I use Vellum or you can do use other formatting software. Just make a new file and upload it and you have a box set. And that's um, last year hitting the USA Today list with the Arcane box set first three books um, and that includes Stone of Fire that one I wrote in 2011 so you can you can revitalize older books older fiction um, over time you can also price them higher so I've got this eight book series and it's 16.99 so and there is no cap on royalties at iBooks or Kobo so that's really awesome so you can go short you can go long and you can start these various um, models based on fiction but you have to have more books <laughs> oh and I wanted to show this because going wide I think uh, and again this is a personal decision but going wide to me is very important because um, Apple and Kobo I can sell higher price box sets um, and get the full royalty and they have great promo opportunities for box sets um, whereas Amazon is kind of people are trained for cheaper prices so all very different um, that you can do okay I know this has been like a whistle stop tour and we've been through um, these different things now the title was how to write fiction as a non-fiction author and I think I've covered the kind of the main important things now obviously every single one of these topics is a lot more you could get into um, but using your strengths filling your creative well learning those skills and do it for love or understand the business model and I, I hope you will I mean the thing is many of you will have written down notes from this talk that's exactly what you are writing down ideas. And all you need to do for fiction is write down those ideas about stuff that are more fictional. <laughs> That's it. But I wanted to come back to that kind of original picture um, of me. Remember me in my pinstripe suit holding that nonfiction book and then me on the lawn holding the first one of Pentecost um, that Joel designed for me back in Australia, back in 2011. And I still... I still remember how hard it is to write that first novel, but I can tell you that it changed my life. I didn't think I could be that person, and yet I have become that person. And you only become that kind of, and I mean, obviously it's, it's all mythology really, but I always wanted to write fiction. And once I had done it once, I realized that I just didn't want to stop. And I absolutely love it. Now, I'm a nonfiction writer because I love helping people. I love making a difference in people's lives. But I'm a fiction writer because I just am obsessed with these stories and I'm fascinated by the world and I want to write more. And my fiction touches people in a different way. So I wanted to kind of challenge you at the beginning of 2017 how much do you want this? You know, you're here on this webinar because you want to write fiction, even though you write nonfiction. So isn't it time this year that you gave yourself some space for that creative impulse? And if all you do out of this webinar is like schedule just an hour or two to go to a cafe with a notebook and just write down stuff, um, I would love for you to do that. Um, and I hope that you will go write more in 2017.